My guest tonight is an actor and model who has starred in one of the biggest so bad it's good movies of all time, The Room. He tours the nation with the film's director, writer, co-star Tommy Wiseau, and has recently written a book about the experience called The Disaster Artist, My Life Inside the Room, the greatest bad movie ever made. Thank God he has a better sense of humor about it than Tommy Wiseau, or else he wouldn't be here with me right now. Please welcome the very awesome Greg Sestero. How are you, sir? Very good. I'm glad to be here. So, anyway, how's your sex life? <laughs> It's all right. I stay away from staircases from now on, but uh, yeah, I'm hanging in there. You, you don't put it inside belly buttons or no, anything. No, no, that like was that. never my thing. Uh, Tommy was a pro at that. Okay, okay. It's it, I it's left impressive. that to him. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know some people like it tight. I just don't know that tight. <laughs> it's very interesting. Yeah, I'm sure he impregnated Lisa's navel at some point, but <laughs> we're going to find out about that. That's where babies come from, right? <laughs> You know, when you hear people quote stuff like that, that come up and say, like, oh, hi, Mark, I'm sure, any of that stuff, does it get a twinge into your eye, or do you really embrace it? I think it's pretty fun. I mean, I'm a big movie fan, you know, I'm sure if I walked by George McFly at one point, I'd say the same thing. So I think it's pretty fun, you know, I think it's cool. Every time I see, um, like, we've joked about, and we've made some quotes and stuff like that, you seem very, you seem very accepting of something that, many people in your situation would want to forget, but you seem to really embrace it and really love it. What is it that makes you love it so much and enjoy I it? I think when I first met Tommy in that acting class in San Francisco, he was somebody that I just saw as this really fascinating character that you just enjoy watching him exist in life. So this movie was an extension of that. So it's like, okay, he's going to make a movie. Oh my God, I got to be there to see how he does it. So I was kind of, it was a kind of a big joke to me, you know, the whole time. So now that people are embracing it, you know, I was kind of like the first fan, I guess you could say, of, of how this whole thing went down. So to me, you got to have a sense of humor about it. It's, it's so hilarious and, and, and people enjoy it. So, I, you know, I can't really complain about that. You you got in you you wanted to be uh, you wanted to be an actor but you actually started off as a model and you transferred into acting. Uh, what was the attraction to acting that modeling didn't give you? It's you know it's so funny with the whole modeling thing. They say oh if you if you go in it's a, it's an it's a way to break into the business is if you're a model then you can make you an actor but it's not the case at all because uh, a lot of people think models can't act for good reason. Um, so I, it was just, I was an opportunity that was offered to me and I, and I, I took it and figured, um, someone said that it's, it's the starving waiter job that allows you to eat lobster. I don't know if that's <laughs> even true, but, uh, yeah, it was just, I thought it was a way to get into acting and it totally wasn't. I mean, the odd jobs you have to do modeling, it, it's such a, a crazy business that, um, yeah, I, um, it was an experience to say the least. Um... You, of course, have been in such, not just The Room, but other demanding roles, like in Retro Puppet Master and Days of Our Lives, uh, roles a lot of people <laughs> probably wouldn't be aiming for. When you got roles like that, was that something where you got discouraged, or did you just say, that's just part of the game? You know what? I moved to L.A. My fourth audition, I booked the lead in this movie, Retro Puppet Master. I had never really had a speaking part on camera and we were shooting in Romania, I figured, you know, why not, why not do it? Uh, I had no idea really what it was going to be. Um, I didn't watch any of the sequels or you know prequels, and I, uh, I watched it. I watched one, I was like, oh, God, should I maybe cancel this? But uh, it was just kind of whatever was offered you know, at the time. And I went out for a lot of cool scripts that never even ended up getting made. And, uh, yeah, just part of the game, I guess, trying to survive, you know, trying to survive the business. Um, you said that you met Tommy in a in an acting class, correct? Of just all, to, of all places. To, to tell me, just tell me the experience of meeting that man. So I'm sitting in this dark basement on Sutter Street in San Francisco. That sounds like where one would meet Tommy <laughs> Wiseau. But keep going. Yeah. And uh, I'm just trying to figure out: is this guy a vampire? Is he a caveman? Like, what's this guy's deal? And he goes up on stage. Uh, very commanding presence. He, everyone's just kind of watching him, and he picks around backstage for kind of a long time. We're all sitting there. He comes out with a, you know, stool. He slams it down. He starts performing the Shakespearean sonnet. Everybody's like just in awe. I mean, people that are normally really quiet are like laughing. They're trying to you know contain their <laughs> laughter, and I'm just 
I'm sitting here going, what's, what's he going to do next? The teacher was very intimidating, so I wondered how he was going to interact with her. And so when it came to an end, uh, she just was like, what are you trying to do? And he's like, I performed the sauna. And she's like, no, you're not. And so they had this really intense argument that was very entertaining, and I felt like he confronted her, and nobody else had done that. And I was like, you know what? I should do a scene with this guy. I need to learn some stuff from him. And so I approached him. I was like, hey, let's be scene partners. And he's like, he looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> So Which cl figure. clearly you were, but it worked out yeah, very well. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was. I was crazy. I was 19. I was down and out. I had almost gotten the role in this movie. I was struggling trying to make it to LA, and I was like, "What do I got to lose? I'm at ground zero. I'm gonna take a chance." That's so fascinating. You you saw this guy that you know you just said you know performed this very crazy sonnet, <laughs> and. And instead of seeing someone that you just said, ah, that's a nutball, whatever, you actually saw something that other people were doing, something that was very yeah, different. Yeah, there was something very captivating, you know, in his own way and very entertaining uh, presence on stage. It wasn't classic in any way, shape, or form, but I, I think characters are really, you know, really interesting. I figured... Why not? He clearly does stuff that is not done by other people. I mean, like, in... And he's, for example, in the room, he makes decisions like he has some lines in some scenes, like the scene with the dog said backwards or out of order. <laughs> uh, there's several writing moments or plot devices that go nowhere. And there's even a scene where you guys are playing football in tuxes like it's an everyday occurrence and it's never explained why. Making this movie, what is your thought process through all this bizarreness? I think every day is an adventure. You just didn't know what was coming. I mean, he would have ideas come to him where, you know, today you have to shave your beard and we're going to do a tuxedo scene and play football. What about that? And we're like, okay, we just got to roll with it. Uh, he, he put as many topics into the film in this breast cancer, football, tuxedos, like all these things come in that aren't really tied in with the plot in any way. It's just all these kind of social issues he wanted to pack into this film to make it as important as possible. And so you just kind of along for the roller coaster and hopefully you don't, you know, end up with your head cut off. You, your attitude in all this seems to be very optimistic. Just, just take the ride, go for it, take the ticket, take the ride. Um, when you do scenes like the love scene in there, where you have to expose quite a bit, does that ever get you nervous, or is that just another part of the game? Yeah, I didn't. You know what? The big thing with this movie, when I when I said I was going to do it reluctantly, was I'm only going to have my shirt off. Mm. So, because Tommy was big on revealing a lot, and so I was like, pants stay on. He's like, oh sure, no problem, no problem. So, yeah, the love scenes were still very, very painful to watch. I mean, you're shooting in a small stage it's about 120 degrees um, no one's really comfortable you're on this staircase that's incredibly uncomfortable that i don't think it's ever you know, i don't even think people you know have done it there before who even it's fantasizes crazy. about that it's not it's there's nothing appealing about it i mean if you just head a little ways up there's a bed right up the stairs i mean <laughs> it's, it's obviously too effort. much of a job yeah, and you can get caught if you're sitting right there on the staircase the door opens you're you have, there's no excuses you can make so the whole thing was just kind of awkward, and it really looks that way on screen. I mean, it's the part where, when the movie comes on where I just bolt for the exit. <laughs> now, I, fast know, forward. I, I, I will disagree a little bit that there's no excuse, because if you were to say, why would we be making love on a staircase, a lot of people would say, I don't know, I have nothing that can validate that. So I disagree a little bit with that. <laughs> so maybe it was actually smarter than we're giving Tommy credit for. That's true. Or, or maybe I think Mark was just so overcome with passion for Lisa that he just, just couldn't wait to have her. Yeah, she was just too beautiful. To totally possible. Um, obviously, you you had this fascinating relationship with, with Tommy Wiseau. Uh, you seem to have a good friendship, but you're definitely not below throwing a few punches here and there, or, or at the very least, just acknowledging what you see about this guy. Just in general, how would you describe your relationship with him? Because it does seem very unique. But also, it seems like you will throw the jokes in, but it's still very loving. Yeah, I, I, it's definitely, there's, I have a lot of, uh, you know, appreciation and, and in some ways admiration for Tommy for sticking through this whole process for this many years and making the project he wanted to make. 
Uh, I, I do see it as for what it is. It's just a very bizarre cinematic experience, and I think that's nothing to take away from anything that Tommy tried to do or accomplished. I think it's just fun in the culture of movies to, you know, treat this film for what it is. And um, but yeah, I think I, with especially with the book, it was important for me to be as honest as possible about what my experience was like, um, and also be you know respectful towards what. Tommy's privacy and what he would want. Has know, Tommy read the book? Uh, he's read parts of it. He said, I support 50%. <laughs> is 50% all he's read or is 50% all he uh, likes? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting for, for the other shoe to drop. I wonder what he's going to say. You know, I'm not going to ask the obvious questions that everybody asks about Tommy, but well, so where is he from? Why does he talk the way he talks? What is he? Uh, but... I do, what do you feel is his thought process? What is his logical reasoning with how to deal with the world in general? Because clearly nobody else understands it, and I think the person who can possibly come the closest to understanding it is you. What is his thought process? Yeah, it's, it's funny. And there's a chapter in the book called Tommy's Planet, um, and I really believe the way he interprets things, the way he thinks there's no one else out there like him. And I noticed that very early on. Uh, he told me a story um, that one of his goals was to have like his own planet, his own casino, his you know his own everything. And he handed me this pen that he had made called Tommy's Planet, and he just is totally different. I mean, he he comes up with lines like with the doggy thing. Like a lot of the best things about Tommy are they're improvised. Like those mo the best moments in the film are just him having a reaction, and. And I think that's what's great about the room is you're seeing something that you couldn't really find anywhere else because nobody thinks like him and nobody would have put this much energy into making a film without getting anybody else's opinion um, and just totally bankrolling the whole thing and pushing it until people finally responded to it. So I think that's what's kept the room going for 10 years is that no one thinks, speaks, or acts like him and I think people just are trying to figure out what really it is. Do you feel you've understood him better the more you've been with him or has it just become more of a mystery I, i've understood a lot more things but there's there's always parts that i feel like just keep turning over new mysteries and new mysteries it's like you just keep getting to these dead ends so i've kind of come to the fact that there's just things i'm never going to find out and that's part of the fun i guess <laughs> um what is something that people don't know about tommy was so that you think they should know I think that Tommy is, there's a part to him that's very human and very endearing and just uh, really, uh, really enjoyable. I think he comes off as, you know, this vampire alien looking guy in the movie and, and his, you know, in his appearances with the sunglasses. But yeah, there's just, just this human side to him that's just, it's so fun going through these experiences with, like getting on a plane or watching him go through airport security. He's just got this really, there's just no one else really like him. And what is something about you that people don't know that you think they should know? Um, that I am nothing like Mark in the room. You're not an <laughs> adulterer? Come on, man. I looked at you and I'm like, dude, he totally cheated on his wife. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, uh, yeah, I'm probably the opposite of Mark. So, for, for better or for worse. <laughs> You know, I was going to say, you don't hang any pictures of spoons on your wall, and that just leads me to a question I think now. What is up with the spoon on the wall? Yeah, the spoon on the wall, or the spoon on the, on the, the table there, it's basically they just didn't have time to put and change a picture and put, you know, take out the stock photo, which is what it was. Um, they, were, they were trying to get a picture of Johnny and Lisa in there, which would have made sense that they have framed pictures of their couple um, on the table, but you know, Tommy's like, we don't have time, so they just left this frame picture of a spoon in there. So, so that stock photographer should be pretty happy that all these screenings, you know, all over having like, inspired <laughs> these volleys of plastic spoons. Oh, if only we, if only you remember like the photographer it was from, we could do a plug for it just right now. <laughs> yeah, if right? you want pictures of and people like business would go booming for that, like just that spoon, like yeah. that picture of somebody tight, just that. 
Oh. A picture of a spoon. You never thought it would have inspired that. It'll turn to like this great kitsch art, like the dogs playing poker and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, so yeah. everyone had this picture of a spoon. It's like, ah, you don't get it. Yeah. So, ah. Maybe we had his name. Maybe, maybe we'll get in the future. Yeah. Maybe we'll put Blake He'll under come forward and be like, I took that picture. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, you, you got this, this book, this disaster artist. Obviously, you really want to tell this story. What made you... What made you actually want to write it down and share it with everybody? Um, I, ever since I made this movie, I've always been asked why. What was the purpose? Why were you in it? What were you thinking? Um, and I just felt to do the story justice for Tommy and myself was really just to tell the whole story of how crazy this ride was. That it's actually a lot crazier than the movie itself. And I felt the more the stories that I told people... Um, they really responded to them, so I felt I just felt compelled by the material to tell it that it's not just this bad movie and just the making of a bad movie, but it's really a story about an unlikely friendship and a, a very surreal take on the American dream that I felt like I hadn't heard before. I have noticed that you have a pretty good impression of Tommy Wiseau, even just the way you said Sonnet was very impressive. Would you be willing to say five phrases in your Tommy Wiseau voice? Sure. Uh, the first one is, it's a me, Mario. It's a me, Mario. <laughs> the next one is, Luke, I am your father. Luke, I am your father. The next one is, I am the very model of a modern major general. I am the very model of the major model general. <laughs> and you mispronounced it, which is just like oh, him. Yeah. I love that. Uh, and the final one is, Sparkle, sparkle, sparkle. Sparkle, sparkle, sparkle. <laughs> you should really go on tour with that, I'm telling you. <laughs> it's ingrained in my memory at this point. It's, I, I've, heard, like, I've heard a lot of impressions. That, that is a very good impression. Um, so you've gone through, uh, you've found success being both a writer and an actor in a very unusual, strange, totally different way. Uh, for other people looking to just get recognition or recognize any of that as either an actor or a writer or both, what would you recommend for them? It's really weird. It's the, it's the things that you least expect to come out that do. I mean, with The Room, I didn't expect anything from it. I had worked on things, um, auditioned for movies that thought would go somewhere, and it was The Room that people really responded to. So... I don't know. It's it, you know I've never been into quote unquote bad movies. I didn't even know there was a market for them. Um, but I would say just get out there and try and do as much as you can. You know I, I randomly decided to take that acting class in San Francisco. I could have stayed home and not push myself to go out and do that, and it brought me on this crazy adventure. So you just don't know what what's out there waiting for you that could change your life. I mean this is this isn't an, an ideal. Obviously I would have loved to have made a movie like Inception or something that that I really respect and, and, and would be passionate about. But, you know, it's the room, oddly, and this whole experience gives me a chance to be creative, and I can't really complain about that. So, I'm going to be honest. As soon as you said Inception, I immediately got an image of Mark just looking around <laughs> going, what's going on here? <laughs> Come on, what's going on here? Wait, wait, what are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> That would have been, yeah, that would have been great. But I think Tom Hardy took that over. So. <laughs> I'm sure you auditioned. Yeah, right? Um, just the whole experience. It sounds like you're very positive about it. You're very upbeat. If you had to sum it up in a sentence, just everything making the room and what has come of it, in one sentence, I would just sum it up. Truth is stranger than fiction. Nicely put. <laughs> Uh, I like to end my interviews with uh, the same two polar opposite questions here. The first one being, what is the toughest thing, either professional or personal, that you've ever gone through, and how did you get through it? Um, well, I'm going to give a little bit more of a, a shallow experience. I, uh, when I was trying to survive you know, as a model, um, I got hired in Las Vegas to be Tarzan. <laughs> really? And uh, the, the idiot that I am, I thought it meant I was going to wear a costume at a convention. So I was like, oh, nobody will see me. I'll get paid to wear a costume at a convention. So I drove five hours to Vegas, 5 a.m., arrive. Uh, they hand me a loincloth. 
and they're like, this is what you need to wear in front of an entire convention. And um, I kind of went to the bathroom, looked in the mirror and cried. <laughs> and I was like, am I going to do this or am I going to head back? So uh, I manned up and I wore a loincloth at a convention for two days. <laughs> two days? <laughs> it was the most embarrassing job I've what kind of had. convention needs you to dress as tarzan it was it was like a food convention a where they, food convention where like the company the tarzan company the owners of Tar, the tarzan brand were starting energy bars so they needed a tarzan to be there to sell them or to at least inspire them and i just got eye rolled the entire time and asked if I was like a dancer from Thunder Down Under. I'm like, no, I'm just trying to survive here and get this paycheck and get out of town. So it was, I kept the loincloth just to remind me, <laughs> don't end up here. So it was, it was pretty brutal. Before I ask the final question, I just had to know, what did you think a Tarzan costume looked that, like? That is exactly, that's the best question of it because the joke was on me. I mean, the whole point Tarzan is this in the jungle. He doesn't have a costume, so I it was just a, it was a just a very stupid moment on my on my behalf. Paycheck and was I, looking pretty I, good, wasn't and it? I, I paid the price. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, with that said, what is the proudest thing again, either professional or personal, that you have ever done in your life? Um, I'd say a big highlight was I'm a huge star wars fan you know who isn't but when the room showed at the zigfield theater in 2010 um it sold out the entire the entire theater and i had overheard somebody say that that was the first time that had happened since the re-release of star wars so i thought it was kind of a it was kind of a amazing moment i mean it was you know, i accepted it for what it was i was very aware that this wasn't star wars but i think the fact that being part of anything that brings that many people together was something that was cool. It is very, very cool. The book, again, is The Disaster Artist. It is sold where all good books are sold, and bad books as well, I'm sure. Uh, but it is an awesome book. Go check it out. My guest was Greg Sestero. This is the part where we talk to each other and act like we still have other things to say. You know, just, and we laugh. We laugh a lot. <laughs> Do a big laugh with me. <laughs> what a story, Marty. <laughs>